So uh, this, this talk is going to be token engineering fundamentals, an introduction to information systems engineering, and the goal here is to basically zoom way out and then dig back down to some of these well-defined problems, um, sort of put them in context and understand how they relate to each other. So um, our goal is understanding, understanding the math side of the tools and then how they relate to our understanding of the design process, how, that, uh, how it relates to the sort of methodologies that we're using and those of people we've worked with and actually our ad hoc tools to evaluate results, as Trent pointed out. There really aren't a lot of tools yet, but you do walk before you run, so it means writing simulations and exploring um, some of these spaces numerically, even before we have tools where that can happen with a few clicks of a button. Um, the talk today is going to be myself and Matt Barlin. He is one of the lead engineers at Block Science. His background is in um, complex systems engineering, but specifically naval architecture and ocean systems engineering. Um, my background is in optimization theory, decentralized systems, and emergent coordination. Actually, got really lucky. I'd been working on these kinds of math problems since I was a sophomore in college a longer time ago than I'm going to admit. And it has happened that the right sort of combination of decentralization, sort of evolutionary problems and optimization theory um, kind of come together in my background as a mathematician and engineer. Um, my PhD is in engineering, so I build things. Um, we are going to start this talk with me telling you a little bit about definitions of things. Uh, definitions of things that are really important to get on the same page and to um, speak clearly with one another and to be able to share solutions. If, you know, Trent mentioned earlier that in engineering, especially with mathematics involved, you have a canonical form of a problem, optimization or otherwise, and you start by mapping the definitions that you have into the definitions that are usable. And we're going to do that with the term network. And if you don't know it, a network is actually w formally well defined as a set of vertices and pairs of vertices. That's actually all it is in its most basic form. And when we have a network that's doing a consensus algorithm, those vertices are nodes. They're computational, communicational, like computation and communication nodes. And their relationships are called peer relationships. They're doing essentially a form of agreement algorithm to say, yes, I agree with you. This is true. And this whole system is actually maintaining a different network state. So in our blockchain networks, they're agreeing about the state of a different system, which is itself a network. And it's defined because the vertices are addresses and the edges are some sort of economic relationship. And so I find this really important in the blockchain community because we tend to compress these two things together and we lose some of the value of the implications of the formal definition. Um, and I'm going to take that one step further and say that we overlap even that second network with another one that we're used to, where the vertices are legal entities. They're us, they're businesses, they're the things that we're used to in the real world, and that those things in turn have similar transactional relationships with one another, and so we have another network. And so if you actually stop and think about what a network is, we're compressing our thinking about networks, three different networks into one, when in reality, this is our sort of default view of the blockchain world as networks. We have networks of legal entities in this sort of fiat economy that we're used to interacting with one another. Then we have this blockchain network, which is the superposition of a bunch of nodes coordinating to maintain the state of another system, which is economic in nature, that represents the interrelation of identities, which are themselves ill mapped to the, oh, they're, they're they're mapped to the legal entities, but not in a way that we know necessarily. Some systems we do, we're moving towards a world where those mappings are expected, but they're not necessarily guaranteed. Now, uh, a quick note about what goes on in this economic or sort of dynamical layer. We have a, a lot of stuff that we've gotten interested in recently, like what does it mean to be stuff in this layer? And um, we're gonna use the term crypto assets, I like it. Um, Chris is pretty much responsible for getting people to use it. 
Um, I'm going to break down into four groups that I find interesting from a thinking about what can be done with this stuff perspective. Um, currencies are basically fungible, divisible. They're positive, real-valued numbers, and we move them around with some rules. Um, then we can have discrete things, which they might be tokens representing digital commodities, but it's actually their math property that you have to have whole numbers of them that makes them interesting. And then we have this notion of uniqueness, which isn't quite non-fungible in the sense that if I have equities or shares of something, an equity of one thing is not fungible with an equity of another, but it's actually sort of fungible with a, another piece of the same thing. So these are things that are divisible and they're unique in a sense, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't have parts of it. And um, finally, we have a common use case that people are familiar with, which is sort of the to titles or deeds and sort of credit to Dieter in the room for writing the tw ERC-21 spec that people are now sort of use as the benchmark in their mind for what it means to be a, a deed in a blockchain space. And so we're actually just saying, okay, well, these are the kinds of things that get moved around in these networks, right? This is what it means to have stuff in this economy, in this world. And there are rigorous rules about how this system works in a way that really wasn't true of software systems outside of a blockchain world. Now it's like, you can't double spend this. Well, I could used to be able to write a piece of software that says, I have two coins. Now you have two coins and I have two coins. But in a, a computational environment with strict rules, you actually have ownership, you have core, they, there's a sort of, you define the rules of reality. And we are starting to create new types of things that are in this reality, and I think of those crypto assets as part of that. But more generally, um, we don't have to own things. There's also other variables about these systems. Um, we have the ability to change the, in, the internal states of smart contracts by saying, well, it was this parameter, now it's that parameter. Um, we talk about smart contracts that impose workflows, which can be represented as certain types of discrete state models. We have dynamical flows like values of money in the Bitcoin network. And we have these rules that allow us to enforce legal states. And the thing that I think is really important that is overlooked, and I'm going to talk about it in a couple different angles throughout this, is this thing called a configuration space or a C space. There's a difference between the all things that could possibly exist in the sense of, hey, everybody has an account balance, and a configuration space that says, OK, everyone has an account balance, but also the space of all account balances has to sum to a specific number. So you've, you've gone from the sort of local notion of individually, oh, I have a balance. It's a positive real number, to Actually, all of the positive real numbers of balances always add up to this other number, which is the total. And that alone imposes a concept called a configuration space in a relatively simple system uh, in Bitcoin. And what I want to point out is that understanding what is possible is a really big part about understanding how to incentivize behavior within what is possible. And we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, further on. I'm going to start by giving a couple quick references to fields. Um, we're not going to go into too much detail. I would expect people to read on afterwards. Um, relatively simple dynamical systems. This is a, a time varying discrete linear model. It's one of those canonical forms where if you fit your problem into it, you get a lot of free stuff. So. Um, when, I, when we view our economic systems as dynamical systems, we, we cast them like this. We say, I'm going to define this variable as this thing. It's going to have these properties, and I'm going to go read in this MIT open courseware material all of the free information, all the free stuff I get about my system because it, I made it look like this. Um, there's also discrete systems, and this is an example of TCPIP. A lot of blockchain smart contracts that like people are making for their products are workflows. They say, this happens, and then if this happens, this other thing happens, and then for, if it's in this state, these other transitions are very avowed, allowed. Um, these are also relatively well-defined concepts, and I, um, I pulled some lectures from Stanford to link here that talk about um, 
sort of complex systems architectures and sort of it gave this as an example of a, of a finite state machine. And these have well-defined state transitions, but they're discrete in nature and they work great for engineering what can happen under workflows. Turns out there's a thing called a hybrid system that just mixes the two together. And a lot of the things that we're gonna contend with in the token engineering world are actually hybrid because they have some natural evolution that is continuous, like the amount of a certain token you have. If we acknowledge that spending money is a um, sort of continuously valued positive variable, we may have some rules or dynamics that, that we need to model our systems accounting for these real valued things, and then we have choices that are actions switching. We're actually going to have an explicit example from Sweepbridge of a, of a hybrid system later on. Um, but for now, I'm going to use this very simple water tech example. We have models that have these continuously evolving behaviors, and then we have a switching action, and that to actually properly mathematically represent this in something for which a canonical form gives you free stuff about what can and can't happen, um, you need a slightly more complicated model, and you're accounting for dynamics in one condition, and then the switch to the other discrete state alternate set of dynamics. Um, so again, I've got a set of slides here from Berkeley. If you're interested in, actually, this is a full lecture notes document um, deriving hybrid systems and how and their canonical forms work and what you might use them for. Um, then I'm gonna kind of bring it back up and we're gonna talk about, okay, cool. So we just talked about some really abstract stuff. Like why do we care? What does this have to do with blockchain? Remember what I said about separating the two networks? Our nodes are working together to agree on the prior state, the system up to the current block height. And then everyone's gonna say, hey, I'm gonna try to do this stuff. And that stuff follows these types of system rules that we were talking about as encoded by the platform that you engineered your incentives, your action spaces for all of the participants in your application. But the lower level network's job is to say, cool, this is how it is now. Everybody tries to do some stuff. Someone says, cool, I found the next block. I'm saying I picked up some of those actions, bu bu buttoned them together and said, here's the new state. And so we have this system, the blockchain network's peer-to-peer -peer network that is responsible for maintaining the valid state of this economic network. And I think what a lot of people do is they skip the part where they characterize these as two different things and then don't necessarily set themselves up to do the kind of engineering process that Trent described because you have to be very clear about what you're trying to accomplish. And accomplishing the task of incentivizing proper coordination about agreeing on the state isn't actually the same as in engineering proper coordination about what you do as you evolve that state. And we're gonna focus on the what you do when you evolve that state in, in our presentations um, because at least the block science team focuses on that layer of the engineering design problem. Um, in part because most of the people that we work with are so looking at some part of this problem, which is, in general, we want to make some product. It's going to have some mixture of centralized and decentralized pieces. And we kind of say, these are some of the areas of interest. And in general, you know, you might have to do a system level architecture that accounts for whatever elements of this that you need. But at the end of the day, if you can't step in and try to solve that problem, or better yet, go find a solution that meets one of these boxes, check the box with the tool, and focus on the one or two things that is really specific to your project, which I've actually highlighted in yellow here. These are the two areas where we find most people really do need to dig in and solve their own problem. But as much as possible, you want to use existing um, sort of tools, whether they are mathematical or even just connecting with other projects to, to solve for some of these other um, components. Um, so I'm gonna give you a quick high view of what Sweepbridge is because we're gonna use it as a recurring example. Um, Sweepbridge is a blockchain-based economic framework. Um, it's intended to support supply chain uh, finance problems and the sort of big picture vision for the project is to build up from liquidity to provide financial services that make essentially um, supply chains more efficient by removing some of the compounding of the costs of capital in multiple layers. And its core layer, the liquidity, is the one that we've focused on as a team while working with the Sweetbridge team. 
And in particular, that liquidity problem is broken up into a two-currency system, which is a token engineering problem. Like, why would we do this? What do we accomplish for doing this? Um, their goal was to have an asset, uh, an asset and collateral back, so simultaneously asset and collateral back stable currency paired with a discounting functional token, something that you would get and you would use it to sort of assert a membership in the community and essentially defer costs that you would otherwise get um, by using the financial services provided. But there's some very special um, requirements that they passed on that we, we brought into the design, which will come up in examples later. Um, the nuts and bolts of it is their loan process is you put assets in, you borrow against it, if you put Sweetcoin in along with the assets, you defray some of the interest fees, potentially all of the interest fees associated. You can use that to make purchases, convert to fiat, do supply chain actions like pay invoices. Um, so I think that's enough that when we go back and we talk about pieces of Sweetbridge, we're not like, oh, what is that thing they're talking about? Like, why are they doing that? That's the big picture of that project. Um, the product manager from the Sweetbridge team is here, so if you're interested in it, you can talk with him later. Um, uh, all right, we're going to talk a little bit about network systems and analogies. So my particular background was through a robotics lab. So I and I my original introduction was through bio-inspired multi-agent like coordination. So I think this is really important to pay attention to what's going on with swarm robotics. Um, swarm robotics is an approach to the coordination of multiple robots as a system, which consists of large numbers of mostly simple physical robots. That's not all that special, but when you say that it is supposed that a desired collective behavior emerges from the interactions between robots and the interactions of the robots with the environment, now you're talking about how we actually engineer these economic systems. We're saying, well, we can't make them do anything because they're all simple local things that do what they want. All we can do is kind of engineer what they want to do and give them a relatively limited set of things that they can see, things that they can do, and then use a whole lot of engineering work to make the net effect of that be what we want it to be. And there's, this, is not, this field is not newer than blockchain. It's not newer than token engineering. It is still somewhat new. Um, I give two examples. Right here, this is research on simulations of flocking, collision avoidance, and other types of coordinated behavior. Um, this was being done in the early 2000s by my undergraduate advisor and one, is one of the main reasons why I got interested in this field, ultimately did my PhD in this type of work. And so I always have to give credit, the, the researcher was Reza Olfadi Saber. He's a AI researcher now who works on actual natural language processing problems. Um, and on the left is an example of some very recent research out of MIT from um, a wonderful postdoc named Eduardo. He, um, this is a link to his work there. He's basically looking at the opposite problem, uh, saying, hey, we're going to do swarm robotics and we want to secure some of the information. Let's use blockchain. So he's say, seeing the analogies in the mathematical problems and using them on the other side of the dotted line. Um, so this is sort of a bridge to, hey, these aren't actually all new problems. The way that we jumpstart our tools is to go find the places in other fields. Um, so with that, I'm going to, so Matt, you should probably be up here, right? So Matt is um, the, one of the lead engineers at Block Science, and I'm going to hand it over to him, and he's going to talk a bit about systems engineering, starting with the analogies to actually transportation problems. Uh, Thank you, Zargam, for... You actually did pretty well staying on time, too, so thanks. All right. Uh, and also, I'd like to thank Trent for his opening remarks as well, because we all come to this from a different level set of experiences. None of us were in second grade saying, I want to work on blockchains when I grow up. So we all, we all have something different to bring to the table. And I think that's really important in, in terms of this community to be able to learn from each other, bring our own obviously very high level set of knowledge that we all have in this room and then learn from each other as we go forward. So uh, yeah, so my undergraduate engineer uh, training was in naval architecture. So I learned how to design ships, anything that floats essentially. Uh, and we can see the probably first day, I believe in naval architecture one, we were introduced to the design spiral. So you 
how to start with a concept design, a set of owner requirements, and you start to develop what your ship might look like. And you go through each different system that the ship needs to have to work. And as those go around and around, you iterate through and eventually get your go from concept to preliminary to initial design to, to eventually construction. And that's a long process. That's a couple years. And in the case of Navy projects, that could be a decade. So we need to work a lot faster than that, obviously, in blockchain. Um, and moving on, then some of my later work involves actually operating on transportation systems at a higher level where we needed to actually make decisions, decisions around whether we were just going to operate with a ship or whether we were going to send that cargo on a plane instead, if it was time sensitive. Uh, and started to look at some of dynamic systems as well. And so that leads into the next slide. So this was actually work uh, by a researcher at Stanford uh, named Balaji, who is, was using dynamic incentive and a dynamic incentive model. The work I did predated people having cell phones where people could actually see real-time data. We, we worked on uh, changing, changing systems. But what he did here was, they were looking at driving people to commute not during peak time. And what they found out was they had a very small budget and they couldn't actually give some, they couldn't split up that money evenly to actually incentivize people to make the action that they wanted. So it wouldn't make sense to give somebody three, everybody in the network to three cents to change their action. So what they found out that worked a lot more effectively was to essentially make a lottery where somebody would get a dollar, but not everybody would get a dollar. And that actually ha drove the actions of the people at a much greater scale than they uh, would have done otherwise. So. OK, and so now we're going to talk about systems engineering and some of the aspects that come out of that. So the first thing, don't think, oh, so First of all, systems engineering, it's comprehensive, it's recursive, it's iterative, and what it does is essentially it takes requirements and turns that into a system product or a process. And so a couple points before I put up a slide that has way too much information on it. That a couple things to think about right off the bat are that we really do need adequate problem definition. We can't just start going way forward before we really try to put the brakes on and decide what the problem is. Uh, and kind of jumping to the else, I kind of made this a little pseudocode. Uh, because what happens is you start to design a problem or design a solution that doesn't actually solve your problem. And so you end up spending a lot of money and time on something that wasn't effective at all. And then the other idea in systems engineering that just, there's a lot, but just to uh, narrow the focus for everybody here today, is that we do need to separate this problem out when, when it is correct into smaller components and to be able to design, test those components. Uh, because otherwise then we get errors, especially when it comes to integration, when we put those components together. Uh, when they don't work, that's way too far along in the process to try to go back. Okay, so here's the slide with way, with way too much information. But where we're really starting, where you essentially start is in the top left corner where you're taking your customer's requirements or their thoughts, essentially their descriptive model, and turning those into a set of requirements. And those requirements do need to be well-defined, and we'll talk about requirements later, okay? Because there is, there's work that needs to be done to actually make sure that, is that thing a requirement? Does it, just because your customer said it, does that actually mean that's what needs to happen in the system? Or will that just come out of what happens? Uh, and then this will start our loop. Once we define our requirements, then we start to build, we start to analyze. Uh, we'll talk later about verification. And that will design our loop as we break this thing in, into components, be able to work through them, and then integrate and solve, essentially. 
and I just want to say before we jump on, and then eventually output. Okay, so we got that big box there, output. And output is going to be any data that actually changes your product or your system, your system product or your system process. So requirements, big deal. Okay, in terms of getting those requirements set. So uh, clear, concise, correct, and complete. Very nice and easy, um, right? But easier said than done. Okay, they, things come come at you from all different angles, and what you need to do is be able to turn that back around into something that makes sense to everybody and really does what you what you what the owner wants the system to do. Okay, a few other key points about requirements. Uh, we don't want to bias the design or the implementation. You don't want to have your solution already in mind because you know that's a natural tendency for people. Everyone comes again with a with a predisposed background, but we really do have to keep that open mind as you move into the at, at this level. Okay? Again, you don't want to get ahead of yourself. You do not want to start doing the design yet because essentially that all that work could be worthless in the end. Uh, yep, so your system requirements, they do need to be understood by everybody. Okay, like they need to be clear. They're going back to that clear and concise that everyone needs to understand, hey, this is what this is supposed to do. Um, and again, yeah, design details are relevant to the system test. And again, this last point is so that you can, by keep, if you hit everything else and you keep that open mind and you're able to have a well-defined set of requirements, then your design will wind up being better than it would have been if you already had your answer before you started. Okay, uh, just quickly a few uh, sets of terms around requirements. Uh, so the, the top three are really your high level. Operational, that's really how does this serve the, the user and under what conditions. So, you know, we, we like to think, oh, this will work all the time under every network congestion ever, you know, and that, that isn't necessarily the case. We need to understand what the limitations are of those requirements, when they should work and when they shouldn't work. Uh, functional, so that's what does it do? Does it do what it's supposed to do? And everything about function is doing, right? It's an action. And then performance, to what uh, extent does that function execute? And the other three are really just uh, byproducts of of those top level requirements, you have, will lead into design requirements, derived requirements, where they come from that higher level, and then allocated is when uh, it's broken off from a top level requirement. Okay. Uh, so I should have jump, just jumped back a quick sec. A lot of this work does come from Department of Defense, major uh, from building system, so building a ship, building a, a Navy fighter, those sorts of uh, large scale systems. So you'll see some of this work come and coming through from there. So uh, again, just on the requirement side, so here we're taking specific requirements and essentially churning it out from input to output correctly. And that does take a design loop where we will do things like model tests, simulate, verify throughout that loop. And so we'll go, uh, later on we'll go into greater detail about that process. Okay, uh, model-based systems engineering. So this is the idea, those ideas of systems engineering with the idea about building a model on top of it. And so this, Classic line that shows up in probably 75% of every, the first page of every data analysis textbook, I believe. I'm not sure, I haven't run the data on that, but all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay, so very simply, uh, you know, at the risk of being pedantic that, oh, everyone knows what a model is. But, you know, there are some things that have to be there. And so, you know, again, I come from the world of where actually 
built physical models of, of several different ship types and tested them, ran them, ran them down a tank, and then took the data and analyzed that data, and then built a computer model and off of that data and compared and verified those things. So, um, but in both cases, whether it was a physical model or whether it was a simulated model, it needed to have uh, a certain set of characteristics, right? So we needed to simplify and make it something that could be modeled, right? Um, and so, of course, yeah, it's a representation of something real, but it's, it's not the actual thing. And so, uh, you know, it's also that tool. It's a tool to be able to do more with, right? Okay, and then so that was a model and a system model. We can see uh, this is where we essentially do like a high level from the top down view of, okay, how are we gonna system, systems engineer a problem using a model? Well, we start with those requirements. We look at the behavior of what is supposed to happen. We have to really uh, dig into the structure and the properties. So what is it supposed to do? How are we going to build it so it actually has the properties that the real system is going to have? Okay. And you know, even though I'm going quickly through this, you can kind of envision how much work goes into each of those things and how much detail and precision you need. Uh, you know, as Trent said, uh, mentioned before in his earlier talk about designing a, a computer chip, right? You, you have to get it right. And, you know, on the blockchain, if it's out on the blockchain, you kind of have to get it right. And so, again, uh, coming from the defense world here, so essentially this is a good little picture about systems engineering, what it, what it looked like uh, traditionally, which was essentially a person that had a lot of documents and ran around and made sure that all the different teams working on that large-scale system were had all the latest and greatest documents and were actually uh, fulfilling what they were supposed to do in terms of their desi the design requirements and making sure everyone, all the different teams were up to date. Uh, with model-based systems engineering, we can kind of, we can integrate that streamline streamline that process and be able to work down through a series of components um, to make that a much more effective tool. Okay, so uh, well, so I just mentioned components. So that's an important part of being able to take a large scale system with several different levels and break that into individual pieces that can be. Uh, manage and solved. So in an, in an example of a blockchain project, we would start off with building that, taking those owner, owner thoughts, brainstorming, descriptive modeling, turning those into requirements. Um, the, there would be the blockchain layer, the ICO layer on top, and then kind of where we are today, what we're focused on with token engineering is kind of that, that middle layer that is going to ideally satisfy the requirements from the, from the owner about the ICO layer or whatever uh, large high level requirements that come from the economics. And then also we really do have to think about the users in that in the blockchain world. They're, they're going to be the users, whether it's whether it's the actual nodes or whether it's the users of the system, they cannot be forgotten. In fact, they're you know, probably more important. Uh, so just a further breaking down of that middle token engineering layer would be uh, the idea that we, would, we could build with a formal specification, which will give us our analysis, which is that high-level analysis, which is really that requirements analysis. Uh, to make sure that those requirements are correctly being are correctly defined and being designed for, and then w when that happens, when that is done, then we can break this into components, each with their own specification, with their set of uh, component requirements, and when that, when each of those pieces are finished, 
then we go into like your system integration. And again, that is another big piece of this puzzle that cannot be overlooked. We can't say, oh, we're just gonna put it all together and it's, gonna, it's going to work. No, that's also going to take very careful uh, meshing of each of those components to make sure that they work properly. Okay, so we're gonna jump. So Zargam talked about SweetBridge before and so here's going to be a few um, example, well, one of the, the first example of where we're going to use the system engineering idea on SweetBridge. So uh, the first thing I wanted to bring up here was that our original customer requirements are dealing with your own, uh, what am I gonna say, your own uh, vault. You have a vault where you have some You've locked in some asset as your collateral, and then you've borrowed uh, some bridge coin, and that's your liability. And so a key metric for everybody's vault is their ratio to their, li their liability to their asset, because that asset has a changing uh, value, right? So if it's, a, if it's Ether, if it's Bitcoin, or, or even if it's dollars, it still has a changing value, and the liability could change depending on the user's action, if actions if they are borrowing more or against as, as those prices change. So um, essentially we wanted to, the original model was that you would have a valid state and if you moved outside of that valid state, there would be an action that would return to the valid state and that, that action would be if the user didn't take it, the system would, and that would be that would be a cell line action. It was called, and so we just have a example here of the different states that a person's vault is in, where they're in good standing, they're valid, where things are, where the asset value may have decreased or their liabilities may have increased during that time, and then we have a state where the cell line is being triggered, and if it goes too far, when, when you're essentially, if you think of your liabilities being greater than your assets, then you're now in default. Okay, and so this is a little bit more detail into the set of actions that can happen uh, between, the, between those states, between the valid state, the lock state, and then jumping into default. Um, so essentially, it's a lot of those same things that I mentioned before that that you can have your asset values changing, um, and the big one is that the cell line could potentially be triggered by the system to sell off some of your assets in order to re return your vault to a valid state. And uh, just an example of the, uh, just the formulation of that and what that looks like under a different set of control parameters by the network essentially your engineering, we think about some engineering terms like your, your factor of safety. Um, you know, how close do we want users to be able to get to the edge? What does that do to the network? If they are allowed to get uh, their assets to get too low or uh, vice versa, liabilities get too high. And then, um, so this is just to kind of wrap up this section is, then we had a set of updated requirements from the customer. And so just to show like that iterative loop of, hey, they came back to us and said, hey, this is actually going to be a little bit different. Um, we're going to have some fees involved to trigger that cell line. And there's, so there's going to be a penalty fee and there's going to be a transaction fee. Well, that actually changed some of those higher level systems. And that's OK, because we can engineer this thing properly and go back through that analysis uh, to do that. And so you see that this changed quite a bit from that first one, okay? That, that simple change in an owner requirement will, of course, will have, can have bigger effects than is, you know, always foreseen, okay? And so that's, and that's where that system engineering aspect comes in, where you do have to watch that flow of effects. And so you can see by adding those fees, and added another, essentially another state in a 
in a vault, and it also added uh, really a another layer to the states because we did have to look at varying asset values and liability values as a result of that. Okay, almost done. So is this you? Yep, that's you. Okay, back to Zer. So I'm gonna go back into some details on about some of the techniques that we use for understanding the behavior of systems. Actually, that last one was an example where we used principles from, from hybrid systems because as it happens, that system has both state changes and even though they're they're well defined over ranges and continuous variables. You had to understand the possibility of variations in the continuous variables, the balances of assets and liabilities that could evolve uh, sort of in a sense outside of the action, the discrete action of the system and the system itself took a discrete action in order to enforce something, changing the probabilities of achieving particular states in particular, essentially defending the default. There was a default state, meaning you don't have enough money in your asset vault to cover it. And the system actively responds by um, enforcing a like basically enforcing a rule that says you can't be over here if you get too close, we're gonna throw you back to the beginning. Um, and you can say that at a high level, but to actually engineer a system that you get, you know, not necessarily even a formal guarantee that it can never default because there are elements in no of noise in the system that you can't control, you can, however, drive down the probability of that happening. And so we're gonna talk a bit more about these uh, systems of variables and how they relate to blockchains. I'm gonna try to keep this not too deep and stay conceptual. If people are interested in the math behind some of this, they can follow up with me. But the note here is just that we can think of this blockchain as maintaining the state of a network. This is our balances of Bitcoin, our sort of account balances and all of the internal state values on an Ethereum network, or an arbitrary blockchain network, to my analogy about maintaining the states of things. So all I'm saying here is that we have a bunch of accounts, they have a bunch of states, and the blockchain says, hey, that new state, that's okay. Literally, I'm validating that, that the new state is valid. And we have this sequence forever of the valid states, and it's made up of state transitions. All state transitions are transactions of some form or another. So we have the states and the changes to the states, which is sort of the, um, uh, the substrate of a, of a mathematical engineering problem. So whether it's a controls, optimization, some evolutionary process, the way that you actually make things happen is to understand what information is available, what characterizes the state of things, and what are the legal actions that cause those states to change. And what is the, the mechanism by which those states change? And in blockchain world, those are transactions. So we are going to think about this in terms of transactions and states. So the first thing that I'm going to use math to create is this value function. Value function just says there's a state. This is all of that stuff. We haven't said anything about what it is. We're not even gonna try to. This is the great thing about math. There's the state of the network, and then there's a, a function, and it goes to one number. My, my Bitcoin example before works here. Literally, in the Bitcoin network, the sum of all of the, the, all of the balances are in the state. An example of V of X would be the sum of all of the balances. And as it happens, the Bitcoin network has a thing which is an invariant property, and that invariant property says that the sum of all of the balances is equal to a number. Now, that number actually evolves in time because of block rewards, but for simplicity, we're gonna think of this invariant as, as equaling a constant. Um, that in this second thing here that looks complicated basically says that f sub l of u of x is just saying contextually anything that can be done by anyone follows a set of rules. That's the set of functions and the actions using those functions. In Bitcoin, this is sends. You send stuff. Well, fortunately, the way that sends work is that they have embedded dynamics that prevent you from double spending. That is part of how sending works. If I send something to you, I don't have it anymore. That is part of the mathematical property of this function f. 
in the, in the Bitcoin example. Regardless of how much, of a set, how much I send and to whom I send it, which is part of what is U here. Now, what's really important is that V of X doesn't change when you do this. In my example, where V is the sum of all of the Bitcoin. And this is written this way because this concept generalizes way, way beyond just the sum of all the Bitcoin being this, the sum of all of the Bitcoin. This creates a set of, we'll call it math tools, and sort of the sense of uh, what Trent was talking about earlier with optimization problems that allow us to like, try to engineer things and kind of know what to expect when we do. So I'm introducing this concept of an invariant, something that, that under all legal acts, so we have a, a state, a function of the state, and then the statement that under every legal action on the state, the property still holds. That's it. Okay. So um, when I was working on the SweetBridge project, I got some requirements for their SweetCoin token that there were a lot of things going on in those requirements. And I, I wrote this, this property in, in their white paper. And, it, and I will say this. One of those requirements was that the fees that were being incurred by users on the network were essentially being defrayed by these, these discount tokens. But we needed to know how much they were being defrayed in a really concrete way, like so that you could do operational revenue planning. OK, that's great. So well, it's a fixed fee for everybody. But no, 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 no. We need to use the discount token to give people free loans. Like, wait, OK, how am I going to make it so that anyone can like, potentially get an interest-free loan, and that person is going to do so by activating Sweetcoin, and they're going to activate more and more Sweetcoin, and their the amount of fees they have to pay is going to go down, and zero is achievable. Okay, that's tricky, right? Now I'm like, well, if I let anyone do this, then in principle, everyone could get free loans, and I'm in direct conflict with my problem of predictable revenue. <laughs> and so what we ended up doing was engineering into the system an invariant property. Um, that invariant property was over the share of the fees incurred that was actually going to be realized as fees under a discount model. And so the discount model was an action in this action space. So you would say, I incurred so many fees, and I am going to give you so many sweet coin and lock them up for, say, 30 days. And as a result, that system is going to return to me in a, a thing that says, actually, you only have to pay a different number of fees. So F fees you incurred, F prime fees that you have to pay. And in, in, this, um, um, in this sort of property that we wrote in our paper, we very complicatedly said this. Now, this is really important. At the time we were doing this, we did not understand what was going on. We were like playing with the math, doing sort of, let me try this, let's see what happens. Wait, let me try this, let's see what happens. And it was only later that this sort of theory of invariance emerged from why does this work or why could this work? Why do we think this is going to work? And we, we generalized it. So um, I would uh, suggest that if people are interested in looking at that white paper, you'll see there's also a, a proof that basically shows a bunch of stuff cancels out that under the rule provided for what it means to get a discount, that a particular property is unchanging, and that property is a ratio, and that is precisely the requirement that was imposed by the, the, uh, the team uh, we were doing this work for. Um, so a quick overview of what that kind of looked like. They were basically saying, we want this to have market pr price independence, so the sweet coin should be determined by how much discount you get, so there's no reference to the market price of the token when you can't figure out what the discount's going to be. And in fact, we wanted these ratios to have certain properties about, all right, the more people who are using it, the standard network effect type arguments. And so this is a little bit of a drawing of sort of how those requirements were being thought about. There's some notes in the corner about implementation, but I actually have a slide about that, so we'll jump forward. Basically, it amounts to an on-chain microservice, or it can be implemented as an on-chain microservice with inputs how m with, hey, I'm doing a transaction. It's coming from a connection with another system that told me what I owed. It says, oh, I owe this. Here are the tokens I'm choosing to activate. And then there's this computation that refers only to local state variables. And so this is important because, yeah, OK, we can define the global state of the Ethereum network or any other blockchain network. But turns out it's really hard to get data that's not specific to your smart contract. So actually, 
the cool thing about this is it only actually cares about a bounded list of other transactions of the same type in the same smart contract. So in terms of trying to figure out how to implement this, we're thinking about it like an on-chain microservice without having sort of other needs. And it, it tends to this intended property. Now, I will point out that we've already modified it since then. And in fact, it's no longer supporting the invariant in a strict sense because we had another requirement come up. And that was if you enforce the invariant, the amount of discount that you could get on a particular action gets noisy. In fact, as the system moves, the next person is going to experience something that's related to what the last person did. And unless the system has a lot of mass in it and the and actions of the individuals are very small relative to the total amount of action on the system, you can experience noise. So we did something that also has a very engineering principle behind it, and that is we, we added a low pass filter. And the low pass filter just makes it so that the system can't bounce around as much. It's a little easier on the users, but at the cost of now tending to the invariant property as opposed to sort of strictly enforcing it at all times. And even then, you know, we hadn't quite gotten this theory of invariance yet. And we've been as a team, um, this is, I will say, a, a form of science, um, but through the sort of opportunities to have conversations that uh, Penn and Stanford and MIT and Harvard and like finding engineering researchers. We've been trying to push the boundaries a little bit on how we understand uh, engineering things with math. So I'm going to make a few more comments about the work that we're doing with these value functions. Um, they tie back to some of the swarm robotic stuff. They tie back to other areas of mathematical engineering. And one of them is that we can make things go up by simply, instead of saying all legal actions make V of X the same, that they're greater than or equal to. So if we're starting to think about these as evolutionary optimization problems, it makes a lot of sense for us to pay attention, not just to what will happen, but what can happen. Not, definition 14 says it literally can only go up. Not we expect it to go up or people are incentivized to make it go up. It can only go up, which is, kind of cool when you think about it. Um, and likewise, we have the opposite, which is we can get uh, convergence properties by having these functions so that they can only go down. Now, I added a little bit of extra meat here. This uh, parameter being less than one is very important because um, these convergence arguments that this is a, that this ties back to actually require a bounded convergence rate. Otherwise, things can stop shrinking. We want to be able to make things that always keep shrinking, so we need a little extra equipment, um, something that we can talk about out later if people are interested. The thing that's really important, though, is that if you can make things shrink, you can control things. Now, this is an area that I think is open. It's at the biggest wide open space in um, engineering, token engineering economic systems, is not just, um, not just, saying you're incentivizing things, but actually driving a system towards a state in a formal sense. Um, I will not say that you can do whatever you want, because you can't. There is a very limited degree to which you can pull off things like this. You do it in sort of modern control theory using a thing called a Lyapunov function, and you do it by very carefully constructing the relationship between your functions V and your functions F. The thing that is really cool about a blockchain network that is different from a physical real world system is that in a physical real world system, you actually have to design something U of X such that F of U of X and X leads to a value function that has this property. That's like four layers. In a blockchain system where you're actually designing the Fs, the, the legal actions, you can kind of skip over all of that nesting and just say, I get to pick the set of legal actions U under the set of legal methods F and compare that back to some goal defined by V. And if I can make the math work, I know something is always true, whether it's this convergence property, this growth property, or this invariant property, not about what people will do, but about what they can do, which is what brings us back to the idea of configuration spaces and a broad need for us as engineers to take a step back and so, sort of look at this problem as like, where can we find analogies to the best tools in engineering fields? And so a main area of research for myself is actually to tie back to 
sort of the type of research that I have done on controls and networks and optimization problems to ask whether we can really design things that do what we want by building, by building the methods and the value functions into our planning for what's this going to accomplish. Like, what is the most important thing? I encode it with V. Then I ask, what am I going to allow F to be? And what actions you under F am I going to allow such that the property that's encoded by V is always true? And now I don't have to worry about incentivizing it. Now, because this is a bounded tool, you can probably do this at, with at most one or two value functions V and two or three, you know, F functions without losing complete track of what's going on. We're not thinking of this as the answer to everything. We're thinking about this as a good intermediate step between defining your problem and then incentive engineering. You just only have to incentive engineer over the space of things that are possible. So if there's really important stuff that you don't want to be able to happen and you can't figure out how to in prevent people from doing it with incentives, you make that the one thing that you take away from the configuration space of the system using invariance or convergence properties. So that's a little bit of a dive in on, on how we look at math as an engineering tool in the token engineering context. And I think it's important that we understand how to tie these in with our understanding of evolutionary systems and our understanding of sort of all of these systems, finite state machines, hybrid systems, uh, evolutionary optimization problems, and op general optimization problems, swarm robotics, et cetera. So if these are, if you know, you're interested in this field, I encourage you to actually branch out of the crypto community and read as much as you can about these fields we're exposing and help us fill in the wiki with the right references from these fields. Um, I, may, I think it's really important to tie back to though, so what about games and how does this relate to games? Um, Trent did briefly talk about game theory and mechanism design, so I'm going to stick to the big blue letters here. Basically, in a game, you, your actions or rewards are fixed, and we talk about best responses. When you design the game, you have mechanism design, but at the end of the day, um, you're still saying, okay, what is the game for which the best response is the thing that I want, but the game is static. And the interesting thing about these blockchain problems is that the games aren't static. And so it's even if you're good at mechanism design, you're gonna get stuck. And that brings us back to optimization, it brings us back to evolutionary algorithms, and it brings us back to um, what I'm talking about, which is how do we control the evolution of the game? As opposed to talk about just designing the game, but understanding that it's evolving, and understanding how it can and cannot evolve. Um, so. Um, in any case, I think I just said all of the things on here, so I won't belabor them. These slides are going to be available after the fact, and there's a reference here to Lyapunov optimization. There's actually a very, very good set of um, Wikipedia articles on Lyapunov stability, Lyapunov optimization, Lyapunov functions, and um, it is a very, very recent development in the order of maybe 10 years, 20 years in to really leverage these tools to control physical systems. And I think that they're incredibly powerful or things like them are incredibly powerful in these um, token engineering problems precisely because we get a, we get we skip past figuring out what people will do and we focus on what they can do. And that gives us tools that maybe get us way further along so we can be a little bit simpler in this incentive problem that we solve. You know, we've, anyway, it, it'll be fun. It's obviously where we're, we're going. So I'm going to go back to Matt and he's gonna talk a little bit more about um, component testing and simulations now that I've kind of taken you guys into why we think this is an engineering math field, not just a numerical one. Thanks, and we're actually still on time, so we're doing okay, we're gonna make this. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm gonna delve into a couple topics here, model testing, uh, which includes simulation and integration as well. Uh, and so uh, something that's gonna come up a few times here, we'll touch on kind of the last point that Trent made about engineering responsibility. Um, and so the first slide we have here is about verification. So even those uh, Department of Ten Defense guys, they actually have a little creativity here and they made a nice big V for us here. So um, one thing about verification, uh, going back to the first thing I said about requirements, if it cannot be verified, it is not a requirement. So 
when we develop that set of requirements, we need to be able to verify that. Uh, and so we can see going through this process, kind of where I started talking about system level design requirements, and as we break it into components, and we're going to simulate those components and design that component, it needs to be verified through testing. Okay. Uh, so some of the things that we've been actively working on at Block Science are performing simulations. So you know, the people in this room have various degrees of in-depth knowledge around simulations. Some of the basics that, of course, are involved are that, you know, we're the core idea is that we're building a tool using a mathematical model, right? We need to obviously really think hard around what assumptions we make. We need to document those assumptions uh, so that everyone also understands the limitations of that model that you're building. Um, we, of course, need to be aware of the range and for each, whether it's a constraint, whether it's a variable, we need to understand what the valid ranges are of those things and, and also what the kind of simulated ranges are, are of those things and ideally they will match. Okay, and we will define our test case and our test uh, set of variables and we'll run that to make sure that we're also answering the right question. We're not just gonna run a test to for the sake of running a test, okay? So, and in the case of systems engineering, answering the right question is doing, validating that requirement, ensuring the functional and operational capabilities of the requirements are meeting what the uh, customer said uh, was thinking. And uh, so that's our process. Of course, we have to think hard about whether in the, for each, uh, factor that is going into the model is a, is this a deterministic process? Do we know how it's going to work, or is that a stochastic process where there's going to be variability and unknown and uh, prob a set of probability curves around that problem? And so, of course, we you know we I'm sure anybody that's worked in this you think hard about what are the what are the randomness of that of that process, what is the right probability distribution to use, and of course we, uh, we look at those things and we run our Monte Carlo simulation, of course, developed by thinking about that roulette wheel, and that's the one with, with two green, it's got the zero and double zero, so, you know, that unfair roulette wheel. Okay, so um, some examples of using this in SweetBridge, so using our simulation tool with a, with a few stochastic processes around network growth, around uh, users deciding when they would use their sweet coin to activate their sweet coin to reduce the fees of their loans um, to get some of that variability. And we can see the, the, the jitters in this, uh, in these curves, not the top level curve, that's, that's, not, that's a step function for the amount of sweet coin available in the system over time. So it, the sweet coin are released through at timed intervals called tranches. And so that, that top level step, step function is showing you how much sweet coin is available at any point in time. Again, and this was one model about how they would release those tranches but then uh, the individual actions of the users were modeled at varying degrees of aggregation, whether we aggregated that as like a daily basis or a monthly basis, and we also analyzed whether we would look at this. Uh, it was a changing owner requirement about how long the sweet coin would be locked for, so that led to um, changing this, this graph quite a bit as we uh, move forward. And then uh, again, Another example of simulating with some stochastic processes here. Uh, here is looking at how at launch time with SweetCoin uh, fee discount. Yep, so <laughs> good old fee discount ratio. So essentially looking at the value of SweetCoin in relation to, in terms of how much discount uh, it, would be, it would essentially trying to define it without using the word discount. Um, so, but yeah, 
losing your fees from your Bridgecoin loan by using your Sweetcoin and how much that how much fees you would actually reduce using that. Um, and then uh, another example here, just as new fees were coming onto the system and how that was changing the discount capacity of Sweetcoin, which is um, essentially the inverse of that ratio. Uh, so now looking at another, we'll essentially look at another example about integration where we're gonna put some of those components together. And so just a couple of things about integration we have are that, I mean, it's fairly obvious and, and we can think about it, that we have our different components and we wanna put them together correctly, the right way. Obviously very important to understand when those different components are going to interrelate with each other uh, in order to do this correctly. Again, this is another this is another opportunity, another place where you need to validate and verify everything works again. So you're gonna validate and verify each component. When you put it together, that's another round to val validate and verify. Uh, and of course, we that verification process comes along with verifying that the requirements work. That's when we know we've got this going. And so uh, going back to another sweet bridge example, this is around the actual actions of Bridgecoin um, and essentially around the flows of Bridgecoin. And so uh, we had to look at this system, again, from a high level system engineering aspect and be able to look at all the possible flows and how will those all integrate together. Um, so. You can see different flows around the Bridgecoin treasury and what users can do and depositors can do. And this is an opportunity. The cell line. Okay. And so, yeah, down here is that cell line uh, process. So that one component that we had before. Yeah. Good call. Yeah. <laughs> so taking that one component that we had that we looked at more in depth uh, as just one aspect of this much larger system. And in our next slide, we're going to look at uh, just two things. Again, this was a, another example of a changing owner requirement or, you know, as, as in the development of a system where we looked at having what the treasury would look like, essentially, when people are depositing money into Bridgecoin and depositing money, taking out Bridgecoin, and what uh, that system would look like. And... Um, Essentially, we're trying to maintain a satisfactory liquidity ratio, so not in the system. So having the treasury having enough money in the system to cover all the liabilities that it has out. Um, and so uh, we had to develop a component where we instituted a new policy for the po deposit accounts, and then we re had to rerun that test. Uh, rebuild that simulation, and so we're able to see the effect of putting that new rule on the system into place uh, with this graph here, which essentially kind of tries to level it out and uh, have it operate at a more uh, safe uh, ratio. And yeah. so, all right, so that's kind of gone through that integration process and now we're gonna kind of jump over the blockchain essentially the development layer and look at okay well now that you actually did have a system up and running and it, do you want to jump in or no? okay all right so once you actually do have your system up and running again um, there's some things to think about that we don't don't just want to let that thing go right and just have it go off into the world we need to really think about, okay, like, well, how do we monitor this system? How do we, it's obviously a great learning tool, so it's something that we, we can, we should be looking at because these are all, all these systems are so new that we wanna be able to look at it and learn from it, right? So, uh, you know, our problem here is, okay, collecting data from the blockchain, right? We wanna, we wanna do that. So, yeah, kind of some of the points, but we do, we want to be good stewards of our 
infrastructure. Um, we owe it to our stakeholders. I think even in Trent's talk, he you know, mentioned that he had that breakdown of stakeholders. We owe it to the stakeholders to be informed about this system, right? And that's investors, users, the community, the uh, learning community, you know, everybody here. We owe it to everybody to really learn from these projects as well. Um, and that's what I said there. And then uh, the last point I put on here was that, you know, we do want to consider, again, this is also like a, a good uh, uh, military term, the operational life cycle. You know, like if you, put, if you put that product out there, how long is it going to stay there forever? Well, it could as long as that, that network is alive, right? So we do want to consider that it's going to be out there. Um, and so now we're going to jump into a example around Crypto's Kitties, uh, built by Axiom Zen, full disclosure. <laughs> so they are one of our clients. But we actually did this. We, so we're going to look at an example of looking at their data. Um, and so they, of course, built a game on the Ethereum network, uh, provided if you look at every graph of the performance of the Ethereum network, you see that big spike and in December, January, and this is why. But this is a great thing to look at because it was low stakes. They built, they essentially built a toy. People weren't putting their own money, you know, hard-earned real money into the system and expecting a return on investment. Uh, it was a game, right? So low risk. If it didn't work, it didn't work. Some people may have had, may, there may be a little more stake in there, but essentially that. And the high reward is the, the reward to the community, that we are both, not only, I mean, the rewards were essentially endless, I mean, in terms of proving out the system, proving out the problems in the Ethereum blockchain, right? But uh, the, the ability to learn from that is, uh, was just wonderful and drastic, and so great. And I'll let you take over for the last. So I'm going to talk a little bit about it, and we're using CryptoKitties as an example because in case you guys haven't noticed, most of the, the blockchain projects are white papers. CryptoKitties is a game that exists. So when it comes to actually doing engineering research, it's really helpful if the thing that you're researching exists. And so um, I, I, it's a little bit tough, that, like it's a little, almost sad that you have to say that, but in reality, there are a lot of projects that we've been interested in and worked on that are in various stages of you know, design work and you know, partial implementation. But when we're talking about token engineering, the thing that you're engineering includes the behaviors, which means that it only makes sense to study it empirically after there are behaviors. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what some of the behaviors that we looked at with respect to some incentives in the back end of this game. Actually, this is research that we, you know, we've done, done on our own for learning purposes, are working on some other stuff with, with Dieter and his team um, that's completely separate from what we're talking about today. Um, the particular uh, incentive that we call out and that we're looking at response to is this one. It's the auto birth fee. In other words, um, the system actually subcontracts the role of making a function call to an arbitrary address in the Ethereum network. So the Ethereum economic network is made up of accounts. Those accounts are you know, unique identities in, in the layer that we discussed earlier today. And what this basically says is I'm going to make a cat, but in order to do it, I need your help, and I'm going to pay you. And someone do it. Just I, I'm not saying who has to do it, and I say I'm going to give you this 0.008 Ethereum, and if you do it. But only to the, to the account that's re actually responsible for this. So it's not um, anyone who tries to call this function, but actually the account that was responsible for calling this function that actually resolves and actually results in the birth of the cat. And the cool thing about blockchains is they're really high-grade economic sensors. So going back to my favorite robotics analogies, blockchains have really good sensors. And so we want to have a look at what that means. What's the sensor data? So we, we coined this term um, midwife. Midwives are the addresses that call give birth. And of course, cats aren't burned without, birthed without midwives, so we can look at statistics over who's birthing cats. And we could see the, here's a handful of the top addresses. They're 
they've individually birthed tens of thousands of cats, which that's pretty cool. It means the incentive is working at some level, right? So we're monitoring this system. We're saying, you know, if I'm the steward of this, this network and this, or this game or this system, and I want to make sure it's working properly, and I do that with data, I go, all right, cool. The incentive at some level is working. People are doing it tens of thousands of times, hundreds of thousands in aggregate, right? Um, we can even look at who is succeeding to make sure that these incentives maybe make sense if we had, say we had requirements about how, how distributed the contributors were, we can at least look at what that is. And so at first pass, we see that the very beginning, uh, Axiom Zen's accounts were doing it. This makes sense actually because until someone figured out that they could do this, someone still had to do it for the game to work. And we see, though, they've clearly intended to only have to do it as a backstop because they've sort of set the system up. Or I should say, whether they intended that or not, that is the outcome, that their choice of incentives and the way that they've put themselves in, in this system is that sort of they do it if no one else does. And when we had a look at some of the uh, other data around the congestion in the network, we see that it tends to fall back on them precisely when it's hard or expensive and you know people don't want to do it. Um, what is interesting here, though, is that the moving top five, at any given time, the top five midwives are all the same addresses, which is, means it seems like it's not very decentralized. But actually, if you look at it over time, um, it's even if you go down to top 10, the top 10 don't do very well, which if you take those two together, what it means is that the top five are always the best, but who the top five are changes a lot. So the, since the top 10 doesn't get a huge share, but the rolling top five always does, someone's o some small number is always the best, but who's the best changes a lot, which is actually kind of cool. I don't know that that was, again, it, I, I'm not going to speak to intent, but we're talking about measurement, and we're saying that the system has that property. And so once you start to understand what property, you measure things and see what properties are measurable, you start to define the things over which requirements make sense. If we say requirements have to be measure, or, you know, measurable or validatable, then at some level, you look at real things and you ask what you can measure. And if you know what you can measure, you can say something about what you can impose requirements on. And so we actually you know, always want to be able to think about the end, even as we are designing at the beginning and in the world of blockchain, we have precious few examples to work from. And I think that you know, using Bitcoin and CryptoKitties are among the best things that we can do to understand the actual emergent behavior of systems. Um, so one of the things that I like to point out, but I won't go into too much detail, is when I say the thing games evolve, the games evolve. Here, intermediate smart contracts were written to call give birth. So, yeah, okay, the incentive was designed so that someone can call give birth, but before you know it, it wasn't external accounts. It was internal accounts that were coded with the sole purpose of giving birth. And not just giving birth a little bit. Some of them give birth a lot at the same time. This is a log scale uh, histogram, so um, the number of accounts that have, have their max give birth is... Um, uh, yes, for a single transaction. So, so literally, instead of calling give birth 10 times, they made a transaction call to an intermediate smart contract, which in turn made n, smart con n calls to the give birth method, so simultaneously called a bunch of times. With the max there that we observed was 23. Someone gave birth to 23 cats at the same time with one, tra with one Ethereum transaction. And this is important because it proves the earlier point about the game itself can evolve. So if you make things in your system that have attachment points to the rest of the world, then even if we had designed the incentives for the auto give birth fee, we could immediately be wrong about what they are if someone plugs extra stuff into it and makes it work differently. And so you can't just assume that incentives are going to work the way that you think you engineered them. You have to have a, you, it, at least in some cases, it really helps to engineer what is possible before you get into what is rewarded. Because that layer can help ensure that even if someone uses a secondary smart contract, a secondary smart contract uses a composition of the functions that you allow on yours, and therefore will respect anything that you did in the can-do layer, even though it can violate what you did in the incentive layer. So the most important things you do actually need to be done at the can-do layer, and then the incentive 
incentive engineering is an essentially, in a sense, pliable to additions to the ecosystem. Hopefully additive additions to the ecosystem, but ultimately you have to be cognizant of the difference of, between what you are enforcing and what you are incentivizing, even under this sort of evolutionary framework that we get from blockchains. Um, and so I will wrap up relatively quickly with this stuff, but basically we flipped through and did some analysis. There's some Medium articles written by another one of our team members, um, sort of playing with what we could learn from looking at the data about midwives, uh, the term we use for these. Uh, we call the accounts making the transactions midwives, and then we have the birthing smart contracts, which are these intermediate tools of midwives. So now we have a new role in the ecosystem, and those, that new role built their own tools to do their job. So it's really kind of cool when you think about how these systems evolve. Um, and I think there's probably some other examples of the way things have extended coming later. Um, anyway, so we looked at profits, we looked at efficiencies. Um, I think that, well, one, these profits are in Ethereum. We didn't merge them with the, we don't know anything really, and we didn't try to do any forensic analysis to figure out when people exited it or like whether they were trying to take the money out. But we did look at how much they made per birth because that tells us something about how good they are at this job. They're a subcontractor. They have some incurred costs. They have some efficiencies with which they do this. And sort of the more money Ethereum you make per instance of this service, then um, that says something about like the operational business of being essentially a bot birthing cats. So um, anyway. The, the cool thing about this one, though, is actually you, you can try and not succeed. So it's also important to remember that there's a non-trivial element of, OK, well, do I put higher gas fees? And do I win more often, but I pay more, so I make less profit? Or do I pay lower gas fees and you know have my give birth to be the transaction that gets picked up less frequently. And so we even start to expose I inherent trade-offs. And if you were to look closely at these, you can see that there are some accounts that are very clearly winning a lot and profiting very little, and others that are profiting more per instance, but not winning as often, which means that there's some latent variable that one might want to tease out about sort of the efficiency of you know, what you're willing to pay as a, as a fee for these calls. Um, in terms of the probability that you're actually going to win and the cost to you. And, you know, this is probably a, it's fun, basically. We can do a lot. And uh, I would say this is in the realm of science and analysis, and that this is, I wanted to make that like last bridge back to the science and engineering. The understanding that we get from this science informs our design, our requirements, and, the, you know, helps us become better engineers. Um, so I'm going to close out my talk about with opportunities and challenges. I think this is always important to address. Um, the first thing that I think is really important, and it actually was alluded to in the first section of my talk, and that is identity and privacy are like, well, I'm going to say very important, but I also think we haven't done a really good job talking about the fact that they're in blockchain land, they're actually very closely related. Um, in fact, the identity of a, of a member of a, of a blockchain network is an account, and an account may or may not be mapped to a legal identity. And the con conditions under which you have the right to see the mapping is actually a big part of what defines privacy. So like, we're never going to get away from the fact that um, we are sometimes going to need to prove who we are in order to use these economic tools property, properly. But there's a difference between being able to prove who you are and continuously having your identity visible. And so I think there's going to be a lot coming. There are opportunities for us to understand the best way to think about privacy in the context of blockchain networks and, and how it relates to identity. And I think that that starts with having the right definitions, which is why I start with the definitions of the networks and decompose them, is because if you understand that this identity and privacy problem actually resolves at the level of the map between the legal identity and the blockchain address, you can ask whether or not, under what conditions should that map itself be available to, to someone. And that that actually determines identity and privacy. At, at, and actually, at another level, you know, at what point do you have the right to see the states of accounts other than ones that you can prove that map to your identity? So there's 
these relationships that exist in the network of legal entities and the network of accounts that we currently only have really one readily used tool, private key, public key encryption, where we say, I am existing as Michael Zargum legal entity in the real world and I prove to the blockchain network that I can be this address with my private key and that is our like really our only well understood readily used discussed mapping between the legal identity world and the blockchain world and people are building identity tools and we're going to resolve this problem but in general I think this is one of the really important areas of of advancement for the purpose of using this token engineering thing to build things that are like society needs. If we don't solve this problem, we have toys, not tools. Um, and then regulation and governance is really important and I think we hit on this enough in the first talk with the references to the, the bridge, but I fundamentally look at this as a form of infrastructure that we're creating in our world and if you think about bridges and highway systems or even the backbone of the internet, as the world grows around these engineered things, we have a a, a duty to, um, or a responsibility to, to make sure that we both engineer them properly, that we maintain them, that they do no harm. And I think that we're in a phase of the blockchain community that where we're moving fast and breaking things, but I'm not sure that that's the right approach when you're building something analogous to the highway system. I would never have, no one would advocate that the like highway system get built up in a you know, move fast and break things, and then, oh well, too bad we crashed some semis. Oh well, let's build it better next. I'm like, th there's a difference between shared infrastructure that's used in society and software. And it's part of the reason why Block Science is a firm that does engineering design work. Like we do, we're bringing principles and from, you know, the defense industry standards. Now, to be fair, we're nowhere near mature enough as a field to apply those standards. In fact, we're really using them as guiding principles. We can't, like, to apply them directly would mean all of the cool stuff that Trent talked about already existed, right? It doesn't. We just agree very strongly that it needs to exist because we need this rigor, and in the meantime, our path to creating those things is to start doing it by hand until we end up build, helping to build the thing that allows us to do it a little bit better and a little bit better, and that that's part and parcel with building a token engineering community is because you don't build that stuff by yourself. You build that as an emerging field, as a community. And so we're essentially inviting everyone here and everyone outside of here to um, sort of come together and and make this a rigorous engineering discipline capable of building infrastructure that improves society. Um, and, and we think that that's, uh, that's, that's what engineering is. I will leave off with a joke and then I'm done. So people love their dystopian sci-fi. In, uh, in the world before, we, we think about Skynet and Terminator and like this central AI singularity orchestrating um, like massive number of robots to, to just be evil. Um, I think that it's really interesting to look at the way blockchain is influencing the, the potential trajectory and I point out that we're actually moving something towards something a lot more like the dystopian future in the matrix because the agents in that system um, were actually autonomous pieces of software that interacted with each other. They had their own sort of local utility functions. They were, they were complete, uninteresting, uninvolved characters who were pieces of software that just like wandered by and did their thing and didn't care because their objective functions had nothing to do with the things that were going on in the storylines. And so the idea that even the um, sort of central figures in the decentralized world were the architect and the oracle and they were at odds with each other, it just speaks to me about a future in which software and AI and decentralization are a thing but that you know we have this without uh, strong um, centralization and so I don't know I like sci-fi I think sci-fi gives us some pictures about the future even when we don't realize why and it's neatest thing about this example from from my perspective is like blockchain wasn't a wink in anyone's eye when that movie was made and to think that it 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 sort of speaks to what m that future might look like under a sort of autonomous decentralized framework uh, speaks to me uh, thank you very much. I think um, you guys are ready for a break because no one wants to go to a, you know, first, uh, a first class in a long session by surprise. 
Um, yeah.